text is simply this, doing ministry from the outside in. Doing ministry from the outside in. There are times when we read scripture and we are inspired to go beyond the natural boundaries and parameters of our limitations. And then there are other times when we read scripture and we are challenged to become more like the Christ and to transform our thinking and our actions to a different standard. And then there are times when we read scripture when we are required to change our methodologies. Scripture has corrective capacity. For there are times in life when we look at what we do and how we do it, we realize that we do it more out of tradition, more out of habit, more out of convenience than according to what the Bible prescribes. Today. Opportunity one more time to worship you. 
We come, God, because you have bid us come. And you said where two or three are gathered in your name, you'd be in the midst. So stop by here, Lord. Stop by here. We need you, Jesus. Won't you stop by here? Somebody's in trouble, Lord. Would you please stop by here? We want to praise you, God. Won't you come by here? Come on, Jesus. Be with us. Sit with us. Talk to us. Hear our concerns. Receive our praise, oh God, and then do what you do best. Set free and deliver. Make whole, dear God. Change us from the inside out and from the outside in, Lord. And after you do, set our feet on a Holy Ghost fire so that we will run out and tell a dying world that you still live. Lord, we love you and we want to be about the business that you've assigned us. And God, we, the business you've assigned us in this moment is to worship you. So receive now our worship. Receive it in the singing of the choir. Receive it, O oh God, in the preached word. Receive it in the way in which we gather together as one community and faith and fellowship one to another. And when it's all over, God, we promise we'll give you the honor, the glory, and the praise that's due your matchless name. We believe you, and by faith we know that it is going to happen in this hour. And so we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn this morning is, before I do that, it is Youth Sunday, and our youth are downstairs having a worship experience designed specifically for them. So if you have a young person under the age of 18, they may go to the fellowship hall where they can experience worship in a style and in a way that is conducive to their learning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Our hymn this morning is found in your bulletin and on the screens. It is to worship, work, and witness. Let us sing to the glory of God.
worship by our missionaries. And so Deacon Rob will come now and lead us in the balance of our worship experience. Amen. Amen. Good morning. As we remain standing, Sister Leona Barbara Moore will come to lead us in our scripture reading. Good morning, Mount Olive, and also to our online worshipers. The Lord's words will be read from the book of Matthew, 28th chapter, verses 16 through 20. You may use your pew bottles or read from the screens behind me. Let us begin. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Amen. Let us now continue in worship.
to God the glory and the honor do his name and with joyful hearts we bring back to him the tithe and the offering 
It's offering time. And God has given us everything we have, including the very breath we breathe. And so it's right for us to give back to him some of what he's given to us. So as our ushers are coming now, Deacon Thompson is going to pray for us. We're going to hear the announcements for this faith community for this week, and we are going to receive your offering unto God. Good morning, saints. Let us look to the Lord. Dear God, we come once again, Lord, with grateful hearts and a love for you in our hearts, Lord. We came to lift you up. We're grateful for this opportunity now, Lord, as uh, we've been reminded you have been so good to us in our lives, Lord. And you don't ask much of us, just 10% in the tithe and then the offering. And so we ask, Lord, that we would give with a cheerful spirit now. Touch our hearts, Lord, so that we would do these things. And that you would be pleased thereby. We ask these things and give thanks in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen.
I am available to you. Sometimes you have to be emptied in order to be filled. My storage is empty. And I am available to you. Let us pray, Lord, in this emptying moment, when we drain ourselves of all pretense and selfishness and self-centeredness, fill us now with a sense of the other and fill us with not our own wisdom or our intellect, but with your Holy Spirit and with your power from on high. God, we pray now that your word would impact your people in such dynamic, dynamic ways, seen and unseen, so that we are a transformed people who are on a mission from on high. Now, God, do what you need to do in this moment of proclamation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's people said together, I want to direct your attention today to the book of Acts, the third chapter, verses 1 through 10. Acts chapter 3, very familiar passage of scripture that some of us know almost verbatim and by heart. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Let us stand, those who can, to give reverence to the word of God. Hear now the text. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the beautiful gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement what had happened to him. Amen. Thus ends the reading of the word, amen. The text that goes, the title that goes with the text is simply this, doing ministry from the outside in. Doing ministry from the outside in. There are times when we read scripture and we are inspired to go beyond the natural boundaries and parameters of our limitations. And then there are other times when we read scripture and we are challenged to become more like the Christ and to transform our thinking and our actions to a different standard. And then there are times when we read scripture when we are required to change our methodologies. Scripture has corrective capacity. For there are times in life when we look at what we do and how we do it, we realize that we do it more out of tradition, more out of habit, more out of convenience than according to what the Bible prescribes. Today, when we look at the passage, we find such a corrective pericope that challenges us to make the proverbial paradigm shift. 
You know what a paradigm shift is. It is one of those buzzwords that is common to our parlance these days. It is a shift in the way we think and in the way we act. It is a, a recognition that our old methodology may not be effective and may not be in line with scripture. All right. And so we move to a new paradigm. And paradigms are really just ways of being according to new ways of thinking. There is a paradigm shift. And when it comes to ministry, beloved, many of us have made the church the central theme and location and motif for doing ministry. For those of us who have been around for a little bit we know how central the church really is. We remember that in days gone by, church was so sacred and held in such high regard that you didn't shine your shoes on Sunday. You didn't even iron your shirt on Sunday. You didn't sew a button on Sunday. You did that on Saturday. Sunday was so sacred and church so sacred that we made preparations for them on Saturday night. Dinner was not cooked on Sunday, and some of you who are old enough remember that you had to take a bath in a number 10 tub yeah. on a Saturday night. Church was just that central. In fact, our elders told us if you want to find someone of, of marriageable quality, don't go to the club, don't go to the beauty salon or the barber shop, but if you want to find a good man or a good woman, come to church. Church was so central that when we had less options, we spent all day in church. Sunday school at 9.30. Worship at 11. Afternoon service at 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And then we had to come back to BYPU. Some of you don't even know what that means, but that's Baptist Young People's Youth. BYPU and then BTU, Baptist Training Union. And then we had to stay till 7 o'clock service at night. Church was everything that we did. We lived church, we breathed church, we died for church. We even looked forward to church. For church was the time on Sunday in which the saints gathered and the praises of God went up. Well, we gathered at church to go into the world and into the community. We came to church to organize our marches and our protests. We came to church in order to meet people and to have fun. Church was the center of life. And we did ministry from inside out. The church was the place where we organized and dispatched our energies to transform the world. But when we look at the text, there is a corrective tendency that is taking place, I believe, that challenges our notions of doing ministry from the inside out to rather the outside in. For when we look at this passage, the Bible suggests to us that as Peter and John were on their way at 3 o'clock in the afternoon for the normal period of prayer, they had an opportunity to do ministry before they got to the place of worship. They did ministry not from the inside out, but from the outside in. And what does it mean when we shift this thinking and paradigm such that church no longer becomes the center, but the world is our place for doing ministry? And you must recognize, beloved, that God didn't call us to come and sit in church, but God sent us and called us and commissioned us to go into the world and make disciples. I hear him say, go into all of the world, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost and teach them to do, uh, observe all things that I have commanded you. God didn't call you to a pew on a Sunday morning. But he called you to go into the hedges and highways and invite men and women to the banquet feast. God didn't call you to a status in the organization called church. But he said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world once the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Church is not the center. The world is the place where we should focus our attention. No wonder the church doesn't have the same prominence that it used to have. Because while we're concerned about the color carpet and the cleanliness of pews, folk are dying and going to hell in a handbasket. And the church seems to have no solutions and no answers to the challenging and perplexing issues of our day. Maybe it could be that our paradigm has been wrong. That rather than doing ministry from the inside out, we ought to do ministry from the outside in. All right, fix it up. Yeah. Now, I'm not suggesting, beloved, that you ought to forsake church and the assembling of yourselves. Because what God has required of us is rather a cyclical pattern that when we are in the world working, our energies will be depleted, our resources will be exhausted, our patience will grow thin, our strength will go weary. And so therefore we need to come to church to have the batteries recharged, to have the tank refueled, to have the vision clarified, to have our muscles re-massaged and, and, and prepared to do more work. But once we have that done, then we leave to the world where our real energies and focus should lie. The Bible says that before they got to the temple, Peter and John had opportunities to do ministry. And in that many of us drive miles just to get here on a Sunday morning, how many opportunities have we overlooked to be of service to the divine in order to get to church? How many folks have you seen with signs that say, please help my family, God bless you? How many folks have you seen living under bridges on cold winter nights and we bypass them just to make ourselves feel good in order to get to church. Well, paradigm I submit to you this morning may be skewed. That the real crux of the matter is that when the people of God take God's word seriously and have a passion and a zeal for the work of ministry that we don't do it inside out but rather we do it outside in. Right, right. That's what's taking place here. I would submit to you that before they could get to the place of worship these two apostles, Peter and John, find opportunities to do ministry. And ministry that is done from the outside in requires that we begin to look at the world differently. Here the text says that they encounter a man before they get to church who is born lame. Text says later in the pericope, for better than 40 years, he's not been able to walk. It's one thing to lose an ability, but it's another thing altogether to never have experienced the ability to stand, the ability to walk, the ability to fend for oneself. No, he has become a passive participant in his own destiny and his own destination. He's born lame. And there are many people in the world, beloved, that are just born without capacity. 
They're born outside of stable family structures. They're born with disabilities. They're born in the wrong zip code. They're born to the wrong set of parents. They're born in, in, in adverse predicaments and situations. And they cannot do for themselves. How tragic it is when we as a so-called Christian nation forsake those who are born with lameness. The text says that before they could get to the church, before they could get to the temple to enter in and pray and worship and have their energies recharged, they encounter a man born lame and they say to him, look at us. Ministry from the outside in requires that we expose ourselves in order to create expectation. Peter says, look at us. We are people of poverty as well. In fact, we've given up a lucrative fishing business to become itinerant preachers of the man named Jesus. Look at us. We are poor just like you. We don't have much. But look at us. And the Bible says, and he looked at them and he was expecting to get something. Right. You see, beloved, if we're going to do ministry from the outside in, it's going to require a certain kind of candid, a candor of character. That we expose ourselves not in order to say how bad we are, but to show how good God has been. Look at us. We're not people of means, but we are people that God has worked on, has changed, has transformed, has empowered. Look at me. I'm not all that I'm cracked up to be, but praise be to God when I catch on fire with the Holy Ghost. I can do more than I thought I was capable. Look at me. Peter can say this definitively and authoritatively because a few days before, it's Peter that lets Jesus down, that forsakes him and denies him. But look at Peter now. With power from the purpose of Pentecost, Peter says, look at me. And all of us can say, look at me. I may not be what I'm supposed to be, but thanks be to God, since I met Jesus, I'm no longer the same. And all of us are ex somethings Or oh, don't get holy on me and act, and act like you've been that way all of your life. You used to be somebody before you met Jesus. You had a past. You had some problems. You got some predicaments. You got some skeletons. But praise be to God. Look at me now since I met Jesus there's been a change in my life and what's old has become new because I am a new creation in Christ Jesus look what the Lord has done I'm not that good but look what the Lord has done I'm not that holy but look what the Lord has done I'm not that great but look what the Lord has done Anybody here want to admit that the Lord has done something in your life that you got a testimony not because you went to school somewhere not because you went to a seminar and somebody shared with you how to get out of your trouble but I am who I am by the grace of the living God praise be to God he's still working on us he's still transforming us he's still renewing us you're going to do ministry from the outside in you got to expose yourself for the purposes of expectation and maybe the problem with the church is that nobody really expects much from the church Accept judgment, condemnation, rejection, criticism. But what if the church were ever to say, look at me. I'm a newborn creature in Christ. Look at me. God has done something marvelous and spectacular in my life. Look at me. 
I can't criticize you because I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Look at me. Got exposed for expectation. And to do ministry from the outside in requires that we simply express the essentials. Here Peter tells the man expecting something. Silver and gold have I none. That's what the King James said. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. I give unto you in the name of Jesus. You see, beloved, many of us have this mindset that money can fix everything. And so we throw money at problems hoping that they'll get better without ever addressing the underlying spiritual dynamics to the problem. We've got not just a leadership problem in our country, we've got a spiritual problem in our country. It's not about budgets, but it's about priorities for those that are least and lost and left out. That's a spiritual dynamic. And Peter tells him, look, I don't have what you want. And I don't have what you're expecting. But I'm not broke. Because I do have something. And many of us in church think that we can't be impactful because we may not have all the money that is required. But when I look at my bank account, it may not be filled with a bunch of zeros. But I'm not broke and neither am I without resources. Because I've got a name that's above every name. In the name of Jesus. And I stopped by this morning to tell you there's still power. In that name. There's still power. In the name of Jesus. Power to redirect. Power to transform. Power to get a resurrection. Power to renew. There's still power. Anybody know there's power? In that name. That, that, that's why whenever something tragic is about to call, to happen, whether we realize it or not, when you're connected to Jesus, the first thing that you do is call on the name of Jesus. The other day I was on 495 on my way home and someone was, was passing me on the left trying to take the lane in front of me. And somebody from the right was coming around trying to get the same spot in front of me. A near accident almost happened. And before I realized, I said, Jesus. And that's what happens because there's power in the name. When stuff goes down, when the world collapses, when your friends leave you, when folks forsake you, the name that you call on is Jesus because there's still power. There's still power in the name. And money can't fix everything. But Jesus can fix, fix it all. There's still power in the name of Jesus. Ministry from the outside in recognizes that power that comes in the name of Jesus. So Peter tells him, in silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto you in the name of Jesus. And then he extends empowerment. Take up your bed and walk. And he fixed his attention on him. And Peter said to him, Rye in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. Now, if we look at this with the least critical eye, we'll all come away with the same assumption and the same conclusion. Here, Peter is asking this man to do something he's never done before. He's never walked. He's never stood. And now Peter has the audacity in the power of the name of Jesus Christ 
to command and invest in his reality. Stand up and walk. One must recognize how perplexing this must have been for the beggar because I'm certain he, he said to himself and maybe even to Peter, though it's not recorded in the text, don't you think that if I could have stood, I would have stood a long time ago. And don't you think that if I could have walked, I would have put one foot in front of the other a long time ago. So what is this that you're telling me to stand up and walk? But you understand, beloved, that when you extend empowerment, you then call people to a higher level of existence. That the potential that comes in Jesus Christ is greater than the problem of your current predicament. Stand up. And well, I know you can't stand. I know you can't walk. But I know there's power in the name. And as long as there's power in the name, your potential is greater than your problem. Get up and walk. And that's what we must begin to do for individuals in the world. Tell them that your potential is greater than your past and your predicament. Let me see if I can make this thing walk. There is a movie out now called Get Out. And it deals with an interracial relationship between a black man and a white woman. And this white lady takes her black boyfriend home, and to which her mother then puts him into a hypnotic state and begins to control him with the power of subliminal suggestion. It's called the sunken place. It's a place where he has become a passive participant in his own existence. He is aware of everything that is operating around him. He can hear, he can sense, he can uh, assess reality, but because he's in a sunken place, he can't do anything about it. But the point of the movie is that somebody tells him to get out of here. And that's all that the people of God are required to do when we empower them in the name of Jesus. Stand up and walk. Get out of here. Get out of your depression. Get out of your fallen state. Get out of your grief. Stand up and walk. Don't stay here. There's more to life than you presently experience. Get up. Is there anybody here today that needs to come up out of something? Come on out of it. I'm here to tell you there's power in the get up. Get up. Get up. Then if we practice ministry from the outside in, it requires that we begin to elevate the eliminated. The man, because of his disability, was not allowed admission into the temple. His disability disqualified him for worship. He was eliminated from the elect of God because of his helplessness and his hopeless condition. But the Bible here says that Peter speaks the word of empowerment into his life and gives him a new future by the redirection simply of the power of the word. Stand up and walk. And then the text says, because he's never walked before, Peter reaches down with his right hand and begins to lift the young man uh, to a standing position. And then the text says, and immediately his ankles and his feet were strengthened. In other words, when you start lifting, God starts healing. We want God to do the healing and then we do the lifting. But God wants you to lift some folk up and see how he'll turn it around. Lift some children up 
and see if grades won't change. Lift some old folks up and see if attitudes won't change. Lift up your spouse and see if they won't get right. You got to lift some folk and God will then start strengthening. He lifted him and immediately his ankles and feet were strengthened. And the Bible says that to show that the healing and the restoration and renewal were complete, the order of the man's actions were reversed. A man who had never walked or stood at, at once receiving that ability, one would imagine that he would get up and take tentative baby steps, unsure of how to walk. But the Bible says that no, when God healed him, he jumped up and then he started walking. He jumped and he leaped and he started praising God. And he went into the temple with Peter and John. And because of the nature of the decorum of the temple, he started making so much noise that he attracted the attention of all of the worshipers. And I can imagine that somebody said, it don't take all of that. Why he got to make so much noise in the house of God? Why is he shouting and why is he leaping and why is he carrying on such? And the text says, and even though they recognized that he was the one that used He's the one that used to sit. He's the one that used to be carried. He's the one that used to beg. Aren't you glad that somebody can say, you used to be? You used to run with the wrong crowd and you used to be a knucklehead. But praise be to God. Since Jesus came into my life, floods of joy, Oh my soul, like the sea billows roll, says Jesus. Do I have anybody here that's willing to acknowledge, says Jesus, says Jesus, I'm no longer the same, says Jesus, I've got a new attitude, says Jesus, I've got a new way of walking, says Jesus, I've got a new way of talking, says Jesus. The text says that they recognized him as the man that used to be brought to the temple gate called beautiful to ask of arms. And then the Bible says, and they were filled with awe and wonder at the work that was being done. In other words, when he shouted, they shouted with him. And if you're going to do ministry from the outside in, when people get their breakthrough, that's not the time for you to be a poe in the mouth. And that's not the time for you to be judgmental. But that's the time that when they start shouting, for their breakthrough, you shout for them. I wonder, is there anybody here that's willing to shout for somebody in your neighborhood? Shout for somebody on your job. Shout for somebody in your house. Shout for somebody in your church. Shout for somebody in your community. In fact, if you look down the pew, you ought to shout for your neighbor right now. I'm going to shout for you. I'm going to celebrate with you. I'm going to rejoice with you because it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you with arms wide open. He'll pardon you for he's done it for me. Shout yeah. Yes! Yes! Shout for somebody else because they're brave.
breakthrough has come to pass. If we're going to do ministry from the outside in, you got to learn to celebrate somebody else's blessing. You can't just celebrate your own. But I guarantee if you look to your neighbor, you'll say, I'm going to shout with you. That's right. I'm not only going to shout with you, but I'm going to shout for you. Because I believe God is going to do something with your mess, with your predicament, with your problem, with your disability. I'm going to shout with you. Because I'm glad to see God moving in the world today. There may be somebody here today that has a predicament a perplexing problem or even even a plethora of perplexing problems that requires divine and immediate attention. If you're here today, then we invite you to come for we recommend you to that name that still has It's not just a superstition, but there's still power in the name of Jesus. Wonder-working power, transformative power, renewing power, all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you stand here today on your feet needing someone to intervene, in your crisis then we are here to extend a hand of uplift but we do so knowing that money won't fix your problem but the name and the power of Jesus Christ can make all things new again so we recommend you to Jesus Christ if there's one here today there may be others that have that relationship with the Lord but need a church home whereby you can grow and be groomed and be matured to do ministry from the outside in, then we encourage you to come by letter or by your Christian experience. This is the moment of decision. Will there be one as the choir sings who will receive this invitation to walk with Jesus and to become more and more like the Christ. If you're here, all you've got to do is step out of the aisle. One of these deacons will escort you to the front. And the Bible says that if thou shalt believe in thy heart and confess with thy mouth, thou shalt be saved. Amen. My sister is coming. Is there another today? Is there another today that would make that decision? That recognizes I need help in this world. Some things I cannot do for myself. But I need empowerment that can only come from above. If you're here, won't you come? For this is the moment in which life can change. I was listening to one of these infomercials the other day. And the lady had just lost an inordinate amount of weight on one of these weight loss programs. And she said the thing that changed her life was that she saw a picture of how large she had gotten. And of course, they showed her before the weight loss program and they showed a slimmer, more fit and sexy version of her previous self. What made the difference in the two pictures? It was the weight loss program. Well, beloved, 
Your problem may not be a weight loss problem or a weight gain problem. But all of us who have met Jesus have a before and an after picture. And that which makes the difference is that Jesus has come to give us direction and empowerment in the areas of life which we were born incapable of. Standing in this text and walking and whatever it is that you can do, it is Jesus the Christ who gives us the before picture and the after portrait. So if there is another here today, as the choir sings, we extend to you none other than the motivation for transformation, the catalyst for change and recreation is none other than Jesus Christ. So as the choir sings, if there are others to come, won't you make that move today, that decision to join Jesus on your journey.